Welcome to Village Bible Church of Cherokee Village, Arkansas. We're glad you joined us this morning. And as always, I want you to take these first few minutes, uh, uh, of course, assuming you're watching it at, at 1040 uh, as, as the premiere live, um, uh, especially right now, take these moments to greet one another, say hi and welcome. And also, uh, just it, and you, it would be good for you right now to take this time to invite someone else to come to this. Like it, share it, uh, tag someone else in it if you're watching us on Facebook. Those are really uh, helpful ways to uh, help get more people involved in this. And um, also commenting is, uh, obviously it's another thing I've been talking about for quite some time, that um, ask questions, let's let's get some conversation going on here, especially during these, these first, oh, 10 to, I guess probably 10 minutes or so of the, of the beginning when we're making announcements and that kind of thing. So um, just want you to do that, and that, that kind of helps get this, this message out as we teach the truth from God's Word in an online world. Um, also, to remind you, if you can watch this on YouTube, you may be watching it on YouTube now, um, but it, all of our sermons are linked on our website, vbccv.org. And you will find them under the Sermons tab, of course. And uh, we have podcasts of most of them recently. Um, since we've gone online, I, or since we've been doing strictly online these last um, couple of weeks, I haven't been re uh, faithfully recording them um, and getting them just the audio podcast on. But um, most of the sermons are available on podcasts, which means you can download them and listen to them at any time in the future. So many of you are anxious to meet together. I was really expecting to be meeting on the campus this morning. Um, so we still have some sickness in my house, but um, we were going to just go ahead and do that meet. We were going to be plenty far apart from one another, and we we're going to do all the sanitizing and um, face masks and things we've been doing since the very beginning, actually. Um, we're not changing anything. We've been doing that since the very beginning. Um, but anyway, uh, we, we just decided that with all the technical issues we have just continued to have, that we're not going to attempt to do it online this morning. But next week, uh, we are planning to do online. And if we have to go back to the old, uh, the old way of, of broadcasting, then we'll do that. But that's, that's the plan as it stands right now. We will also be having music next week. Uh, that's Again, that's the plan. Um, so we'll be having worship music, and so we're looking forward to that. And um, so also, if you're watching this, uh, well, you are watching this online right now, but um, if you would kind of uh, give us some feedback on how that works for you. Some of you guys, this is, this is your only uh, avenue of, of fellowship and, and, and church, as it were, and that's to uh, plug in here online. So I would really like to get some feedback on um, on the music, and not necessarily the style or anything like that, just a, a matter of, is that something that is helpful to you? Um, I don't know if I should even be asking that question, but um, if, if it's, I don't know, right right now it's not even it's not even a possibility for us, but by next week we will we're planning to get back on with that. So do I do want to thank you for joining us this morning and encourage you to get involved. Uh, Wednesday night we have our prayer meeting via Zoom, which means no matter where you are, uh, you can join us. We have people joining us uh, literally from around the country on Wednesday night. And uh, this is a really good opportunity for you to get to know people in the church and find out what's going on. And, and, and it's not just a gossip session nor, nor a chat session. It is, I mean, there's that fellowship component, but it is, um, it is about prayer. And I, I spend quite a bit of time, usually on Wednesday afternoons, uh, making phone calls and trying to get information from everyone about prayer updates and praise reports and things like that so that I can spend 10 to 15 minutes at the beginning of the prayer meeting just going down the list. And so we don't we don't spend a lot of time taking prayer requests. I've been in prayer meetings before where that, that gobbles up the entire time and then someone offers a three-minute prayer at the end and says, Lord, bless all his requests. We, we don't do that. I, I'm very uh, in intentional about keeping the prayer sharing part very short so that we have plenty of time to pray. 
so a lot of times what will happen is, and, and every time, in fact, what happens is when I get done sharing prayer requests, I say, now, if you've got anything else that, that you'd like to share as a prayer request, voice that in a prayer, and we will take note of that. So that's Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, Howard it will get a, 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 an invitation out to you via email uh, so that you can join in, off, join in that with us. I would really encourage you, if you haven't done that, to uh, plug in with that and get involved in that way. Uh, also, as I've already said, invite your friends to watch online. And um, if you have any prayer needs or questions or anything like that, please contact me. Uh, my email address, I think there's contact information on our website. You, of course, message me right here on this Facebook um, thing. You can also comment in YouTube. Um, the advantage of the contacting me through the website or if you have my email, uh, just give that to me or send those to me, is there's, there's a privacy <laughs> Um, you're not sharing with the world. But anyway, uh, we do want to pray for you, encourage you. And if you have questions, I may not be able to answer them, but I can I can listen to them and I will get back to you with the answers um, as I have time to look them up. I want to remind you also to worship through giving this morning. Uh, you can do that online at vbccv.org slash donate dash tithe dash tithe. Uh, there should be a tab on our website also. You can find that pretty easily. Um, but so if you're still wanting to mail checks, and that's fine. Uh, mail them to P.O. Box 627 in Cherokee Village, 72525. <laughs> you just have to take my word for that. Um, anyway, 72525 is our zip code. Um, make those checks payable to Village Bible Church. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I just wanted to remind you about that opportunity of, of worship and getting involved. So we're going to get started this morning on our study. The title of the message is Remaining Steadfast Through Trials. And this is out of, it's not out of James chapter 2, as a typo there. It's James chapter 1, verses 1 through 12 in the series Living for Faith. And just to, as a reminder, I'll be using the, the English Standard Version, the ESV. Um, and you can download that as an app on your device at esv.org. And uh, just encourage you to do that. But as always, as I say, um, if you've got a printed Bible that you can open up and follow along, that's, in my mind, that's preferable because you can make notes and underline and that kind of thing. Uh, but James is going to be, well, James and Matthew are going to be our text this morning. And I'll, of course, I'll have those on the screen for you. But anything you see on the screen, unless it's otherwise noted, is, is probably out of the ESV. So let's get started this morning. As we're, we look at the we look at the book of James. Last week we, we looked at the whole book of James, the uh, chapters 1 through 5, and we looked at the overall structure of James. And, and then, then we, as we looked at all of it and we took those major points, it, we, we realized it becomes clear that James' overall concern for the, for the Jewish churches in, scattered throughout many nations of his day was how to live out their faith in Jesus. It's like he was doing precisely what Jesus said when he ascended back to heaven. James provided the first written collection of what Jesus, or what Jesus commanded with an apparent uh, consideration of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave. In some ways, then, James is like a Ten Commandments version of Christian living, a quick reference guide to living the authentic life in Christ. He starts by addressing one of the major threats to our faith, and that is living with trials. And that's from outside sources. He lists, he, he gives those first. And that he, he jumps right in with this. He doesn't mess around. He gets right to work. He gives this brief introduction. He launches into then he launches into what must have been a major issue facing the churches of his day. Now let's face it, this has been a major issue for churches ever since then through this very day. Those who comprise the church face this from many outside sources. Uh, the question is, how do we live with this? How do we respond? And James says this. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So, as always, we're looking for the structure of this text. Last week, we looked at the overall structure of, of the book of James, and we had that image of the tower stretching up into the sky and, and creating this, you looked at the I-beams and things and you saw all these pieces fitting together and you step back and say, oh there's that tower, and this idea of Christian living corporately and personally 
But even in those little individual parts now, we're looking at the sections. So we have this first section, and even within this, this section, there is structure. And we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to be see, we'll see how that, even in this little section then, it points us to an application. Don't forget, we don't start at the application and look for verses to fill that out. We start with the text, and we, 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 we dig into that text, and that's when we find the application, just as a point of, uh, just as a note here. Uh, so many of you have, have heard me say this before. I, I will oftentimes, I will have gone through an entire passage of Scripture for the entire week, and it's Saturday evening or, or Sunday morning when I could do, when I didn't have to do this on Saturday. Um, uh, Sunday morning sometimes, not, not often, thankfully, but uh, sometimes it's Sunday morning. And I've been through the text, and I've seen the structure, and I've seen these parts, and I've seen all this stuff. But I'm still like, what's the application of this? And and this this week as I did that, uh, what, and and oftentimes this happens, I get through that study, and then I go back through my notes and I pull out the outline, and as I'm looking at that outline, as I'm putting this PowerPoint together, even the, the slides that you see, that is oftentimes when the Lord begins to solidify them in my mind. Here's the application. As I look at all these pieces fitting together and the overall structure, it points to an application. And so we look at the structure of this text and it helps us see the bigger picture and the Holy Spirit's application for our lives. I've already explained last week why I see verses 2 to 12 as relating to one another as part of a larger section describing living with trials. But within this section, I see three instructions relating to meeting these trials successfully. The first two sentences, verses 2 through 4, give the first instruction to count it all joy. And we must have misread this, right? He must be talking about finding joy in Christ, in your relationships within the church, in the blessings of God. Those are things we can count towards joy. Now, that's all well and good, but it's not what James addresses. First, he addresses when to do this. When? when we're meeting trials of various kinds. Now the good news about that is that that means that we have reason for joy way more than we ever thought. Think about that. We all meet trials of various kinds every day. Most of you would say right now, yeah, you better believe I'm facing a trial. And James says, no, God says, count it all joy. But why? Verses 3 through 4 answer that very clearly. First of all, because testing produces steadfastness. Uh, picture a lighthouse standing firm against the strong winds blowing high waves. Steadfastness indicates a strong foundation to which your faith is anchored. The other thing about steadfastness is that it's a matter of standing firm over time. Steadfastness under trials of various kinds, is not strictly a matter of endurance. Surely it must include that, but the expectation that the full effect of steadfastness over a period of time is perfection and completion. I added what I think is an important qualifier to this endurance that I want to discuss first. I said, over a period of time. And while it's not explicitly in the text, it's clearly implied in the word steadfastness. Steadfastness is translated from the Greek word hupomone, defined as steadfastness, constancy, endurance, or a patient, enduring, sustaining perseverance. All the words in that definition point to something that happens over an extended period of time. Your completion, your perfection, as it were, and mine, in Christ, then, depends on enduring hard things that test our faith. Not just once in a while, but over and over for a long time. And that means, as James calls us to count it all joy, he, he, he's instructing us to have a different attitude towards difficulties, hardships, and trials that come at us from outside our own control. Many prominent church leaders in America today are expecting a dramatic increase in hardships on those who refuse to compromise living in obedience to Christ's teaching and commands. Some churches already face that just because they want to obey Jesus' command to assemble together. Yes, here in America, today. 
James's readers faced increasing opposition and even in some cases persecution, not unlike what we expect here soon. James encouraged them to embrace the challenge with joyful expectation of what God would do in their lives because of and through it. Most of you would probably say, even right now, that you're feeling the pressure of various trials. Now, it may be in the form of health issues, financial strains, pressures at work, stressors in the home, or something else, but you feel the weight of these things bearing down on you. The Holy Spirit, through this text, says to you and me, Hey, I'm doing something powerful in your life to make you more like Christ. That work of the Holy Spirit in our lives should excite us. The problem is that we get so caught up in the drama of the trial that we easily overlook what God is doing through it. That's why the instruction to choose to have joy in the midst of trials is followed by a second instruction, which is recognizing the need for wisdom and then asking God. Verse 5 says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now some English translations, including notably both the King James and the ESV, omit a very important connecting word that's included in the Greek, and I have it in, in the, on the text uh, on the screen there, but, which makes it clear that what follows the instruction in the preceding paragraph is very much related to this. But, it's a conjunction. It joins the sentence before and the sentence after. And it's important. Catch this, folks. God is, God, asking God for wisdom is not just a wise proverb that stands on its own merit. It's connected to the verse before it by this conjunction that's left out of many of our English translations. Recognizing that we lack wisdom and need it from God is a good thing, but it's not all this verse addresses. You know, I've read and applied this verse in that way all my life. That, oh, we just ask God for wisdom. That's, we just ask God for wisdom and he'll give it generously. That's, that's been my approach to this verse all my life. Uh, it, but it's so much more than that. When we read it in light of its intended connection to the verse before it, we discover that this wisdom relates to living with trials and having joy in those trials. Our natural wisdom convinces us that we have a right to be upset about our challenging circumstances. We scoff at the idea of counting it joy that the transmission went out, even as we were on our way to serve God. And I can tell you that none of us who are working with this, this technology stuff right now are naturally inclined to respond by counting as joy the trials of producing live video content for you on Sunday mornings. It's a complete interruption of things that seems so unnecessary. We reason quite logically that there's no reason to joy in that trial. It's a distraction from the studies and preparation for teaching, uh, teaching you and learning for myself. That's my distraction. I don't understand, Lord, why do we have to why do I have to have this going on? Of all the things to be distracted by, the video stuff really? And it's evidence that we lack the necessary and unnatural wisdom to face that trial with joy. Our tendency is to ask for grace under trials, but God says instead to ask for wisdom. We probably don't ever think of that, which may be one reason we struggle so much. That's the instruction, but it comes with explanation. First, as to why God gives it why God gives it generously. In the midst of the trials, we need wisdom generously. Do we not? Think about it. A couple years ago, we did a Bible study that followed the life of Richard Wormbrand, a pastor in communist Romania in the years after World War II. And he was there as, as a believer, as a pastor, in fact, in Romania. And World War II was over, but communism was on the rise, and they were, they were coming in, and they were threatening. They weren't really threatening. They were offering all these great things. And, and he, he made the statement that communism and, and, and Christianity are diametrically opposed. They cannot exist together. And he found out that he was exactly right. And so he was faced with many situations in which he needed great wisdom from God on the decisions that he would make that would impact his church, his family, and his life. Those were dark and difficult years of intense persecution for him. 
How could anyone have joy while being imprisoned and tortured 14 years for the witness of Christ? Again, surely we understand the need for grace in those situations, but it's generously given wisdom that leads to joy. The second explanation with the instruction to ask wisdom for the sake of joy is how to ask. He says to ask by faith or in faith. Don't forget the connection of all this to trials. This is more than a general request for wisdom. The time we most need wisdom is when facing trials. Seeking that wisdom will find we will find by itself to be an exercise in faith. Let me let me re-say it again. Seeking the wisdom that we need in facing trials by itself is an exercise in faith because what we really want is is an out from those trials. We need wisdom. And he he says the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed by every wind. That's the one who when faced with trial abandons faith and in a very real way is tossed about by every wind that blows against his faith. James put it this way. He says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Note the conjunction, but, again. This is intended to connect to what is before it. It's the how of the second instruction. A key word or phrase here is tossed by the wind. The definition of the Greek word from which tossed by the wind is translated adds depth of meaning to this that we might otherwise miss. Rapizo means to toss to and fro, to agitate. It refers to the wind or persons whose mind wavers in uncertainty between hope and fear, between doing good and not uh, between doing and not doing a thing. You've probably known someone like that. Maybe you were that person at one time, or maybe you are right now. You just aren't sure if it's worth all the hassle. Like the Israelites who had been freed from slavery to the Egyptians, you look back on those carefree days when you lived in sin without feeling guilty. You see people around you who have time to go out on the lake on Sunday morning, who aren't made to feel like they have to carve out time for personal devotions each day, who go get drunk or even get high and they don't feel any guilt for it who engage in promiscuity without fear of getting caught. And then you think to yourself, I traded all of that for what? To be ridiculed for being a fuddy-duddy goody-two-shoes who doesn't know how to have fun? To be mocked for following an ancient backward religion? To be accused of being ignorant and uneducated and buying into some something that goes against science, archaeology, and all human wisdom? You know, a, a hokey religion that is no match for a good blaster by your side, to quote Han Solo. Add, and, and add to that the threat of actual physical persecution, and all these trials seem to validate going back to the old ways, back to Egypt, as it were. This is the record of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. They exemplify for us the idea of being tossed about, always wavering between faith and fear, between doing and not doing. A picture of the waves of the sea tossed randomly back and forth by the wind is the perfect description of this person. And sadly, churches are full of them. Like the Israelites who fail to look over the Jordan River in the Promised Land and consider all the future benefits, all we can see is the trials we presently face. What's more, like the Israelites in whose camp the Lord's presence was visibly manifest in the tabernacle, we overlook the presence of God in our lives in the person of the indwelling Spirit. We can become so consumed by life that we neglect to ever just walk with Him. Thus, we waver back and forth like the waves of the sea. It's a very dangerous way to live. And James lays out the danger next. Having made that statement, he places another connecting word, this time a preposition, for. It's kind of like the word therefore. It should get our attention and cause us to look back and see what is it there for, or grammatically correctly, for what is it there. James lays out the devastating consequences for the one who wavers in faith. He says in verse 7, For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Don't expect to, to, to get anything from the Lord if you're tossed to and fro by the winds of the world. It's a stinging rebuke. 
to be called double-minded and unstable in all your ways. But that's precisely why this person will not receive the wisdom from the Lord that is needed. Don't miss this application here, folks. When you're under pressure from outside circumstances, which, by the way, will be constant in life, in case you don't already know that, you can't choose joy as per the instruction unless you also exercise faith. If you refuse to believe in the love, faithfulness, and wisdom of God when things aren't going as you think they should, asking for wisdom from God is a pointless venture. With no obvious connection to what was before it, James then seems to change gears. When he says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, in his, in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Now one could argue that, that this is one of those statements that stands on its own merit, apart from what comes, be comes right before or after it. There's no connecting words we've seen before, and the thought seems unrelated to the preceding. And so we can just memorize these, these three verses as, as standing on their own, right? Now it might be a safe conclusion if it weren't for something we find in the next verse that connects it to verse 2 and indicates that all of this relates to living with trials. Observe in verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. The reference to the man who remains steadfast under trial clues us in that he is concluding what he started in the second verse of his writing, second sentence of his writing. Verse 2 introduced the idea of counting it all joy when we meet what? When we meet trials of various kinds. And so with this in mind, it seems that verses 9 through 11 are still related to trials in the Christian life. If we see a first and a second instruction, as I have it outlined, it stands to reason that we might find a third instruction. So I want you to, you can look at that instruction, I summarize it, I'll, I'll come back to it in a little bit and talk about it. But looking at this, at this first part of verse 9, the first word, let, that's an imperative verb, a verb telling us that it's definitely an instruction. Though the, the mark of a coming instruction is clear, the instruction itself is perhaps not as clear. Now you see it there on the screen, or if you've, if you've uploaded or downloaded the, uh, the sermon notes, you see it on your, on your paper. You see that instruction. It seems pretty clear. But if you look at the verse, how in the world did I pull that out of that verse? One thing that is clear is a distinction between the lowly brother and the rich. Their instruction instructions contrast their positions in societal hierarchy. Both are to boast, but each... There we go. Get the, the circles coming right. Both are to boast, but each in the opposite of what they have in the world's eyes. Now, you may not like the word boast. It conjures up negative images in our minds. The Greek word used here means uh, literally to glory. The King James translates it as rejoice, which is perhaps more palatable. But the idea remains the same. It's an instruction to be excited about something as a great honor. Not something of which to be ashamed. It's a theme drawn straight from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The exaltation of those rejected by society and the humiliation of those exalted by society. The challenge in this context is that James is addressing brothers and sisters in the church. Is he intentionally making a distinction between these classes of people in the church and thus exacerbating an, an already painful subject for the church? Surely not. So what is this about? The clue lies in the context of the rest of the paragraph in James, which is, again, held together by a string of obvious connecting words. Look at all of them. He's got because and for and, and so also. All of this speaks to the rich, as I said, borrowing from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It emphasizes the temporary nature of what is accumulated by the pursuit of wealth. It's important here that I reel you back in from the images that are undoubtedly popping in your minds when I say the pursuit of wealth. Most of you in this audience are off the hook when you look at it from that perspective. 
We don't consider ourselves wealthy. Consider, though, do you own a car? Do you have a home? How are you watching this message right now? On your device? On your TV? How are you doing it? On your computer? Likely those are just a few of the material goods you own. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, and James is by no means knocking the accumulation of stuff. But if we read this as leaning heavily on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it makes sense to look at what Jesus actually said, so we gain some understanding of this paragraph. In Matthew 6, Jesus also spoke about the temporary nature of the grass. James mentions the flower of the grass that falls off in the heat of the day. And Jesus spoke of the grass being alive today and thrown into the oven tomorrow. James is obviously borrowing from Jesus' analogy. James, remembering the words of Jesus, which by the way weren't yet recorded by Matthew, wants us to have a proper perspective on wealth. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we'll find that Jesus did not knock the accumulation of stuff any more than James. James, is, James summarizes in two sentence, sentences what Jesus said in a whole paragraph. Now I'm going to read what Jesus said as, a, as recorded in all of Matthew 6, 25-34. I should have told you earlier to uh, open your Bibles to that passage because I don't have all of it on the screen there. I, I left some of it off for, to, for space. But I'm going to read Matthew 6, 25-34. Of course, this is Jesus talking at the Sermon on the Mount. Picture all these people sitting there in the grass listening to this rabbi. Listening to this rabbi. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows you need them, or that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus' point was not to criticize wealth or the accumulation of stuff. His point that he repeated at the beginning and at the end of the section is, do not be anxious. In other words, don't become so consumed by it. James echoes his principles. Trials of life are, are the great equalizer. Whether rich or poor, you will face trials. Jesus says, do not be anxious. James says, to the one of low estate, rejoice in your exaltation to the position of an heir and child of God. But to the wealthy, rejoice in giving up your position of earthly wealthy status to be united to the humbled Son of God who gave up his position of wealth and status in heaven for our sake. James levels the playing field of church, putting all saints on the same level regardless of their status among men. Financial or social status is a tenuous thing in the world. Those who fixate on advancing or even just maintaining their position in that create for themselves an unnecessary set of trials. The things you obtain or achieve in this life are, as James says, like grass that has beauty for a season. Sooner or later, hot, dry weather prevails and the grass is scorched in the hot sun and fades away. And so it is with wealth and material gains. You're going to have to learn to live above those trying circumstances, looking to something more. Realize that your earthly station in life matters nothing in the kingdom of heaven. Which leads to the conclusion of the principles regarding trials. Facing the trial, the trying circumstances that come our way comes with a promise. As we've already seen, verse 12 relates to verse 2 and indicates that all of this section relates to trials. Verse 12 is an encouraging conclusion to key principles for counting our trials as joy. 
He says in verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. In the midst of trials, James reminds us of a promised blessing. With all our talk about suffering for the name and sake of Jesus, looking beyond financial strains and worldly status symbols to the example of our Lord who left his wealth and position in heaven, we might be inclined to think it is somehow wrong to think about future blessings. The fact is that you need constant encouragement when you face trials. It's why leaning into your walk with him is so critical, but it's also essential to be able to look beyond the trial to the reward at the end, the light at the dark tunnel of life's trials. 2 Peter 3 offers this encouragement, 2 Peter 3.11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in, li in, in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You know, the knowledge of an eventual end and something better serves as an encouragement to the one who remains steadfast under trials. Steadfast. That's an important word that James already used when he started this. You know, I've wrestled for years with the fact that of the hundreds of people, young and old, whom I've discipled over the years, it sometimes seems that only a handful remain steadfast. I'm always disappointed and heartbroken over those that are anything but a lighthouse standing firm in the storms. They, 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 they don't seem grounded in the word and promises of God. Sadly, there seem to be few who become so grounded in Christ that they will stand steadfastly. They could become beacons of light in a wicked world that not only draws a lost sinner to Christ, but also encourages other Christians to stand steadfastly. Instead, they become part of the waves that beat against the faithful. As James described the faithless, they're like waves of the sea tossed about by the words by the winds of life. In whatever way the culture around them blows, they just go with it. Ironically, many of them would say, oh, it's just because they don't want to they don't want to make waves. Unbeknownst to them, they become waves that add to the storms beating against the faithful. It tears at the heart of the faithful to see those they love who once claimed or even still do claim to follow Christ, embracing cultural mores and movements that go against God's word, even in the name of tolerance, acceptance, and love. These become waves beating against the few who stand steadfastly in the midst of those storms. Our hope, our promise, regardless of what others who once seemed faithful have since chosen and done, is that the one who remains steadfast will receive the crown of life. It's a promise that should encourage us to faithfulness regardless of the waves beating against us. Right now, one source of those waves is pressure to compromise biblical truth and the resulting moral standards. Whole denominations have, at worst, fully embraced, and at best, divided over whether or not, for instance, homosexuality is acceptable before God. And even whether or not a woman's right to choose trumps an innocent child's right to live. Those are some of the winds that toss some people's faith to and fro like waves of the sea. There is a strong warning to those who are not steadfast through trials to compromise or abandon their faith. But there is an equally strong promise to those who remain steadfast. James doesn't tell us to remain, doesn't just tell us to remain steadfast. He gives us the tools we need to do so. If you've been following along the past couple of weeks, you may have seen some of the trials that, that Melissa and I have been facing. And I can tell you that the Lord has helped me this week as I've been studying this passage. But I can also tell you quite kind, candidly that I, I don't claim to have this in hand. Uh, this is still a, a battle for me. Maybe you've picked up on that too. I know that many of you are facing some very difficult trials right now. You're saying, I don't feel like counting these trials as joy. Have you ever considered asking for wisdom in trials? That's not really something I'd ever considered before I dug deeply into this passage last week. 
If your trial is a financial struggle, change your focus to finding satisfaction in your position in Christ rather than the things you need to fill your house or life with. If, if these seem like an oversimplification of what seem to you the insurmountable trials that are getting you down, remember the last of, of all, remember last of all, the crown of life, that promise to those who remain steadfastly grounded in Christ through trials. This is how we can learn to count it all joy when we're faced with trials of many kinds. Cling to these things. Cling to these promises. Follow these instructions. I can tell you that this week as I, as I looked at, at that verse, uh, the, 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 the counting it all joy, I, I heard that one. I knew that one. And I knew about asking for wisdom. But I had never connected those two until this week. It's life-changing when you begin to see your need for wisdom when you go through trials. And the promise that when you ask for it as you're going through trials, God will answer it and He will give you abundant wisdom. I'm reminded of the, again of the, of, the, of the study we did following Richard Wormbrand, Tortured for Christ. And here's a guy who, who uh, he's facing all kinds of, of troubles and trials. and per- He knows persecution is coming. He knows it. And, and he's making a cry, cry to, to the other people and saying, This is not good, guys. Uh, hang on. The, these promises they're making, they're not, they're not true. Only, only bad can come from this. And he's begging God, not for grace to go through the trials, but for wisdom. Because he needs wisdom. Think about that. Think about the wisdom you need to face the trials. More so, dare I say, than the grace. You need wisdom. I need wisdom. So let us close this morning with prayer. And I'm going to pray for you. Because I know I'm not the only one who faces trials in life. My trials are maybe light compared to what you're facing. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the promises in your word, the promises of great blessing. And Lord, we thank you even for the promises of trials. Lord, there are things that we don't particularly enjoy or relish. And yet, Lord, you say to us to count it all joy when we face trials of various kinds. Lord, we know that this means you're doing something powerful in our lives. May we not run from it. May we embrace it. And then may we, Lord, then seek your wisdom in how to deal with it. And Lord, we know that you will give that wisdom abundantly. We thank you, Lord, for the ways we've seen that in our own lives. We've seen that in the life of the church. Lord, may we continue to be faithful, steadfastly standing against against the winds that, that beat against us, the trials from outside sources. Lord, we love you, and that's why we want to remain faithful. We want to remain steadfast. We want to be that lighthouse that stands against the waves beating against it. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of your Holy Spirit who indwells us, empowers us, and equips us. Lord, I pray for each one this morning who is, or this afternoon, whenever they're watching this, Lord, who is facing their own struggles, their own trials. May they be encouraged, Lord, to to ask you for wisdom in faith, knowing that you will give it generously, abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you're encouraged this morning. I hope you have, I hope the Lord has spoken to you through his word this morning. I trust that he has. I know he did me this week as I, as I studied this passage this week was one of those weeks as I was studying I thought man this is why I love to study God's word it is so cool when you see things like this I look forward to what we see in in the rest of chapter one in the next section I think the next section is only a couple of verses and I I ask that you would pray for me as I continue to study pray for those who are still those of us who are still working on uh, the audio video stuff and uh, we need great wisdom that, that's really what we need as we face this trial. So uh, we will look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. We, I would encourage you again to join us Wednesday night 
for our prayer meeting. I think that will be an encouragement to you, and uh, we'll just we will we enjoy that time together. We enjoy that time together in prayer as the Holy Spirit moves amongst us. We'll see you later.